Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey guys, alright. Just finished lunch. Ready to go. If you are new to the channel, hello, my name is Connor. I am from Rhode Island, best state in the Union. I like to learn about history through YouTube recommendations. The original link to the video, top of the description, right below that. Link to the Discord, just click on it, send you right over there. You want to talk about history, chill out, whatever helps me interact with you more easily. Love to have you. Pull up a chair. And right below the uh, Discord link will be the link to my second channel, where I do the more non-history-related reactions. Obviously, I would love you uh, on both of those channels uh, to join. Let's go. My bit. I don't like that. Let's go. Uh, this is history of Civilis. Yeah, you guys didn't, and fair enough, I talked about the sea people too, mu too much on the last episode. And uh, definitely have more to learn on the Bronze Age. I'm ready to learn. I hope you are. If you are not, there's the door, my friend. You're in the wrong class. Home ec is down the hall. Make me some lasagna. Yeah. That'd be nice. Okay, can monarchs commit crimes? Let's find out. Hope you're all doing well. If not, you will. About one of the most you'll be good soon. Important trials, human trials, in the history of the planet. It took place in January of the year 1649 okay. before a newly created body called the High Court of Justice. The charges, tyranny, treason, and murder. The defendant, the King of England. It's a good channel, really good channel. This trial helped to write the legal doctrine of popular sovereignty, which is the idea that political legitimacy emanates from the people. It's a simple idea, but it stood in stark contrast with another legal doctrine, which are... Sorry guys, I just spilled water all over myself. All right, let's go. Which argued that political legitimacy emanated from... emanates from the people. It's a simple idea, but it stood in stark contrast with another legal doctrine, which argued that political legitimacy emanated from God through the institution of monarchy. This was called divine right. Generally speaking, these two ideas stood in opposition to each other. Popular sovereignty was bottom-up, divine right was top-down. This theoretical disagreement over the source of political legitimacy resulted in several centuries of, uh, troubles? And one of these troubles was the thing called the English Civil War. The capstone to the English Civil War was that thing I want to talk about. The trial of Charles I, King of England, Scotland, and Ireland. Trial of the century doesn't begin to describe it. This would be the trial of the millennia. Let's do but it. in order to fully appreciate what was to come, some context is required. The English Civil War is notoriously complex. Some would say boring, but I would say complex. All English history to be seems to be. King Charles I, separately and simultaneously the King of England, Scotland, and Ireland, believed that political legitimacy emanated from God and manifested through the crown, divine right. A consequence of this belief is that Charles saw other sources of political power as a diminishment of his own royal authority. He therefore did everything in his power to reign without ever consulting with Parliament. This was tricky, because without the consent of Parliament, you couldn't tax the people of England. To compensate for this, the king raised revenue in a number of creative ways, such as diverting money that was intended for the navy, as well as arbitrarily demanding loans from the nobility, and throwing them in prison when they refused. This was exactly was easy. as popular as you might think. In time, Scotland rose in rebellion. At last, after avoiding Parliament for 11 long years, Charles was forced to, in his eyes, diminish his royal authority by asking them for funds to raise an army. Parliament was furious. Instead of giving the king his army, they went right for the jugular. They outlawed his creative means of raising revenue, and then charged some of his closest political allies with treason. A short time later, Ireland rose in rebellion. Parliament then took things up a notch and tried to take control of the military away from the king. For Charles, this was the final straw. 
he ordered five of the most radical members of parliament arrested. I just picture him like, no, 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 like closing his ears, la la. Parliament refused to give up their own, and there was a standoff. When they asked the local militia to seize the capital, the king fled north, and England was engulfed in a civil war. The fighting dragged on for four years, leading to an unprecedented level of mobilization. The English Civil War became, and remains, the deadliest conflict in English history, twice as deadly as World War I on a per capita basis. An entire generation of men and women were prof- this, It's the same with the US and, you know, deadliest battles and deadliest wars, the Civil War. It's because casualties on both sides are going to count towards the population, obviously. Foundly radicalized by this event, Charles was eventually forced to flee up into Scottish occupied territory, where he was captured and then handed over to Parliament. The king escaped and fled to the Isle of Wight, where he was captured for a second time. From captivity, Charles was able to convince a sympathetic Scottish army to invade England. Yeah, saying, I love that how he was sent to Scotland, and then he escaped Scotland, and then he messaged Scotland being like, hey, why don't you... That, that's interesting. ...of a wave of royalist uprisings across the countryside. Let's pause here, because this would become an important point. After the people of England suffered World War I-sized casualties, the King of England turned around and asked another country to invade. To the already radicalized English people, angry doesn't begin to describe it. Their own king had just stabbed them in the back. At great cost, the parliamentarians fought what was basically a second civil war, eventually defeating the Scots and quelling the uprisings. That brings us up to September of the year 1648. Parliament had just won two civil wars, and the king was imprisoned on the Isle of Wight. The problem was that nobody knew what to do next. Parliament was made up of two distinct bodies, the House of Commons and the House of Lords. And unsurprisingly, given the context of the Civil War, the House of Commons had been the ones driving the agenda. The Commons was split into two factions. The larger of the two was the moderate faction, who favoured squeezing some religious reforms out of Charles, reducing his political power, and restoring him to the throne. The Independents, on the other hand, named after their desire for independence from the Church of England, wanted to go much further. They had a long list of demands, including a call for a brand new electoral system, where poor people were actually given the right to vote. A ra what? That's insane talk. Radical idea for the time. You might notice that there was no royalist or conservative faction. The Civil War had seen to that. So the commons were split between the moderates and the independents, with the moderate- I'm an idiot, I pressed stop recording for a second. I understand though, all right, I got it. The civil war had seen to that. So the commons were split between the moderates and the independents, with the moderates running the show. But the really interesting dynamic I is that the English army was also split. The officers generally favored the moderates, while the rank and file, radicalized by the Civil War, mostly favored the good. independents. This made for a complicated political situation. But of course, there were heterodox views within each of these groups, especially within army leadership. Lord Fairfax was the commander-in-chief of the army, nice firmly hair. in the moderate camp, favoring a negotiated settlement with the king. Oliver Cromwell was Fairfax's second-in-command, and kind of had a foot in each faction. He sided with the independents when it came to their radical religious reforms. He was quite religious himself. But he also sided with the moderates when it came to forcing political reforms upon the king and restoring him to the throne. Becomes slightly hypocritical later when... Because doesn't he ask for hereditary... Um, Anyways, I, or I don't least, know enough That's here. what he had believed. The experience with the Scottish invasion had changed Cromwell, and he was no longer certain that the English people could trust their own sovereign. Henry Ireton was another high-ranking general, and Cromwell's son-in-law. 
Ireton favored radical political reforms, which made him an independent. He was a firebrand, and he wasn't shy about speaking out against the monarchy and the nobility. One contemporary described him as having, quote, the principles and temper of a Cassius. <gasps> Cassius? We actually know what that means. What is it? What? Uh-huh. No, not Cassius Clay. Longinus. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. I knew it was something I should have known. Sorry. <gasps> Cassius. We actually know what that means. But nothing's that simple. Despite being broadly aligned on policy, the independents in the Commons kept on denouncing Ireton for various philosophical disagreements. For example, the most radical of the radicals argued that private property was an invention of the crown, and so if the crown went away, private property should return to the hands of the people. Ireton disagreed with this, which led to him perpetually being cancelled by his closest political allies. But for the time being, this fighting among the independents didn't really matter, because the House of Commons was controlled by the moderates. They decided to send representatives from each faction to the Isle of Wight to negotiate with the king. This team of negotiators was initially quite successful. They got Charles to agree that Parliament had gone to war in its just and lawful defense, which meant that everybody who had fought in the Civil War would be immune from prosecution. A big win. They also got him okay. to agree to a whole host of political reforms. Parliament would be fully autonomous, with the ability to pick the King's ministers and implement their own policy. These were huge concessions. The independents wanted radical political reforms, and it looked like they were going to get them. The moderates but... wanted to restore the king to the throne in a reduced capacity, and it looked like they were going to get that too. A settlement seemed within reach. There's a but coming But in then, here. the negotiators made a key discovery. The king was an unreliable partner. He would make a big concession, and the next day he would take it back. They were forced to go over the same points again and again and again. The king seemed to be playing for time. When it came to religion, the two sides could not make any progress. The negotiators, particularly the independents, wanted the Church of England to get rid of Bishop. Sorry, is he going to have like someone come in and murder them all? Because that, that's what it feels like right now. He's buying time for something. The negotiators. If there's anything I've learned when someone's trying to negotiate, whether it be in civil matters, civil war, or war against someone else, whenever there's negotiation and someone seems like they're stalling, it's because they're waiting for someone to come so that they can flip-flop, turn the tables, and get you. Particularly the independents wanted the Church of Sorry, England I that. seemed to be playing for time. When it came to religion, the two sides could not make any progress. The negotiators, particularly the independents, wanted the Church of England to get rid of bishops and become more egalitarian. This, the king would not do. He would agree to no, a partial no. set of reforms that would expire after three years, but nothing more. This wasn't enough for the independents. A less hierarchical Church of England was central to their ideology. I mean, he's, he's been accepting everything. It seems like what is what is these what are these proposals are they really proposals if you're just gonna or are they demands since you just seem to he said k k and then now you're as that discussions dragged into their second month the negotiators began to lose hope at one point two of the moderates got down on their knees and begged the king to just give in to their demands if these negotiations failed, they said, the army, full of bloodthirsty radicals, would have no choice but to intervene. They might not bother negotiating. I don't trust them. While this was going on, Ireton was urging the higher ups within the army to break off negotiations and arrest the king. Ireton and others worried that the rich people in agree. the House of Commons were going to sell out the poor people in the army by restoring the king to power. Ireton found some support among the officers, but Fairfax, an aristocrat himself, remained steadfastly moderate. In frustration, 
Ayrton began going around and gathering public support for a long list of radical demands, which included putting the king on trial, abolishing the monarchy, and replacing the House of Commons with something else that better represented England's poor. He was quite successful. Public opinion began to shift, and the idea of putting the king on trial became quite popular, especially within the army. Fairfax and his moderate allies started to become nervous. After several days of debate, they decided to speed things along by presenting their own list of demands to the king. What they wanted was basically a military dictatorship, with the king's eight-year-old son on the throne as a puppet. Charles did the right thing and flatly turned them down. This was a big deal. Fairfax had just stabbed the negotiators in the back. When news broke, the House of Commons and the army were immediately at each other's throats. Events were moving quickly now. If the House of Commons came after the army, things might devolve into a third civil war. Caught between a rock and a hard place, Fairfax did the politically savvy thing and publicly threw his support behind the radical independence in the House of Commons. The moderates were now caught between the independent minority and the army. They agreed to vote on some of the more radical independent demands, like putting the king on trial, but then they delayed and delayed and delayed again. It quickly became clear that the moderates were playing for time. The negotiators on the Isle of Wight were days from an agreement. On December 1st, Fairfax made his move. A bunch of soldiers showed up on the Isle of Wight with orders to bring the king to the mainland. The negotiators protested, but they had no means to resist. Fairfax had seized the king. On the next day, the army marched on London. When the House of Commons learned what was happening, the most moderate of the moderates packed up and fled the city. Fairfax had a tiger by the tail here. He was personally a moderate, but his army was out for blood. He believed that if he moved quickly and forced a harsh- Sorry, I know this is it's just my ADD. I gotta get out what I'm just thinking in the moment. It just, I love how s styles change every now and then, uh, obviously. And, and just, you can see what's popular in terms of like, oh, what, like the hairdo the guys have or, or the type of clothing. And if you just took out uh, Fairfax's face and put in like an 80s girl's face, like the hair would match perfectly. <laughs> and back uh, in mid 1600s, it's just like, it's the best uh, male hair look. And then 300 years later, uh, it, it becomes the best woman. I'm sorry, I just ADD. And that's what came to my mind. It's out of my head though, so I can move on. Moderates packed up and fled the city. Fairfax had a tiger by the tail here. He was personally a moderate, but his army was out for blood. He believed that if he moved quickly and forced a harsh settlement upon the king, he might be able to save the monarchy. Maybe. If not, the nobility might be next. Revolution was in the air. Within days, Fairfax had occupied the capital. On the morning of December 6th, a bunch of soldiers, led by a guy named Colonel Thomas Pride, posted up just outside the House of Commons. When members of Parliament started showing up, Pride checked their names against a list and refused to let any of the moderates inside. Things got out of hand pretty quickly. Some of the members tried to force their way into the building, at which point they were arrested by Pride's men and taken away. This event is known to history as Pride's Purge. In total, over 200 members were expelled from the House of Commons, including 45 who were arrested. Many of those who were turned away saw the writing on the wall and fled the city. This new purged House of Commons was less than half of its original size. People were terrified and many feared that the- So that's like if they were Republicans, so that's like, just to make it easier for me to understand, so like Democrats, Republicans, um, independence but that's gonna so that'd be like if a democrat was in charge or uh and like uh the like standing at the door of congress and not letting republicans or republicans in charge standing at the door and not letting democrats so like the, everyone inside would be of the same party and understanding because that's crazy the purges were not over 
In the weeks that followed, most people stopped showing up to the commons. A legislative body that had once had approximately 500 members now met with sometimes as few as 40. The army had pulled off a coup d'etat. Critics of this new legislative body called it the Rump Parliament, and the name stuck. But here's the thing. Fairfax did not order Colonel Pride to do this. Pride was acting on Ireton's orders. Fairfax was I'm well, furious. Brother, this uh, was I'm... not what he wanted. His plan had backfired. When Cromwell, Fairfax's second in command, voiced his support for- Sorry, I have to pause again. It's just like- <laughs> It's like, so per, like one guy, uh, so that you, you have his people in London, obviously uh, communication isn't fast. And then this guy out here going to get the king, and while he's going to get the king, he's like, all right, remember, you guys, we can't just do this like a bull in a china shop. Just, we need to, to smooth the edges and just- Get what we want through a little tweaks, a few tweaks, and then he hears like, "Yeah, they didn't do that. They just sent everyone out and didn't allow any of the uh, moderates in." And then he's just, "Sorry." Pride's purge. Fairfax had no choice but to follow suit. He had effectively lost control of his army. The radicals were running the show now, and they were looking to Cromwell and Ireton for leadership. This new rump parliament, finally free of moderate influence, immediately got to work. On January 1st, 1649, they passed a bill establishing a new 135-member tribunal called the High Court of Justice. This body would be empowered to put the king on trial, with its members acting as both judges and jury. Fairfax, Cromwell, and Ireton were all appointed to the tribunal with the rest being split between radicals. I'm going back, I don't care, okay? I just, how can you sit, imagine being one of these guys, like how could you sit there? I can just imagine like crickets and like, <clears throat> like really, how could, like I would love to see the look on their face, like just in this giant room where there are 70%, 75% of the seats are just vacant. And they're just like, okay, we are in session. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, you want this? You want this? You want this? Hey, do you? Yeah, well, that's everyone. And I, I just, how can you sit there and not just like, be like, all right, this, this isn't, this isn't all right. What are we doing? New 135 member tribunal called the High Court of Justice. This body would be empowered to put the king on trial with its members acting as both judges and I bet it will be very fair. Jury. Fairfax, Cromwell. I mean, let me let me say, I, I don't like this uh, Charles, King Charles. I don't I don't like this king from what I've been hurting. I don't like him at all. But um, I don't like these people either. And Ireton were all appointed to the tribunal, with the rest being split between radical independents from the commons and acknowledging my ignorance. from the army. The legislation I gotta shut and up. Ireton were all appointed to the tribunal, with the rest being split between radical independents from the commons and officers from the army. The legislation also called for a Lord President of the High Court of Justice, who would be responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the trial. They first went to some of the top legal minds in England, who explained to them that what they were proposing was almost certainly treason. They later found a local judge by the name of John Bradshaw, who openly favored abolishing the monarchy, and appointed him to the role. But there was a problem. The House of Lords, which was made up of prominent members of the church and the nobility, refused to ratify the creation of this tribunal. On January 4th, the rump in the House of Commons passed a resolution declaring that all legitimate political power flowed from the people, which meant that the House of Commons had the right to exercise full sovereign authority over all of England. Popular sovereignty. over all of England. I know these, these, I'm sorry if I'm dumbing it down and mo a lot of, most of you, vast majority, like 90% of you, more than that, are not American. And so maybe I'm, I shouldn't even be making this comparison, but it's, so that's, so the House of Commons is sort of like the, the House of, um, House of Representatives and the, House of Lords is sort of like the Senate. Most of you guys aren't American anyway. I, 
So we'll probably not um, continue. Popular sovereignty. Now things were really cooking. According to the Rump Parliament, the House of Lords and the King were politically irrelevant. Anything passed through the Commons became law. This is insane. I, when the King learned no what like the Commons had done, he said in utter disbelief that no law existed under which a King could be charged with a crime. He was right, but it didn't matter. They would put him on trial anyway. On January 8th, the High Court of Justice met behind closed doors to discuss bringing charges against the king. By now, it was clear that Fairfax had lost control of his army, and from this point forward, he rarely attended meetings. Cromwell was in charge now. King Charles had asked a Scottish army to invade England, and so the tribunal started things off by throwing around the word treason. One member, named I... Sidney, caused a bit of a panic when he explained to the group that a king could not commit treason because the technical definition of treason was violence against the king. And even if that wasn't true, the High Court of Justice had been established illegally without the consent of the House of Lords. Cromwell, when he heard this, burst out in anger. I tell you, we will cut off his head with the crown on it. Sidney responded, I cannot stop you, but I will keep myself clean from having any hand in this business. The tribunal pushed forward without Sidney. So clearly a treasonous act would, I mean, textbook treason. I'm not talking about in our modern view of it's everything so political nowadays. I just treason, I mean, treason would... Like, undeniable treason would be, hey, you, other country, I'll do whatever I... Like, helping another country's military to invade your own country, right? And that's pretty much what he did. But can you commit treason if you are the king? If that's the definition of, of treason, then I guess that's correct, too. Me. It was not immediately clear what kinds of crimes a king could be guilty of, and over several days they discussed every conceivable scenario. They considered charging the king with the murder of every person killed over the course of the Civil War. They considered charging him with gross incompetence for the mismanagement of the English Navy. They considered charging him with the murder of his own father, the former king. This was a totally made up thing. But it was convenient for their purposes, because yeah. it actually met the technical definition of treason. After agonizing oh, over these questions, right. the tribunal agreed. <laughs> Sorry. I did that just that just came to my head. Like it seemed very random. Like he killed his own father. Oh, that's funny. Uh that that's just made up. But <laughs> still they heard like, well, technically that's not treason because our definition of treason is you know, against the crown or whatnot, and how can you commit treason if you are the king? And then someone's like, well, he murdered his dad, who was the king, so treason. And it's like, is that true? I don't know. Agreed <laughs> on a specific set of charges just, that accused the king of being a tyrant, a traitor. I am learning more about human nature. I am learning just as much about human nature than I am about history through all of this. Not just this video. I mean, in all of the videos I've ever reacted to. It's just... It shows you how often a large squabble amongst many people in one country or different countries is so reminiscent of like two random people arguing. Um, fascinating. Traitor and a murderer who sought to subvert the fundamental laws and liberties of the nation. As an olive branch to the moderates, the tribunal agreed to limit themselves to actual crimes that had taken place during the Civil War. Nothing about the king murdering his own father. Aww. These charges hinted at some fundamental questions. Could a king commit treason against his own kingdom? Where did political legitimacy come from? If the people rejected their king, was he still a king? Isn't this all answered by whatever?
does it matter if people reject a king if the king is is a hereditary monarch so i would say yes he's still a king even if everyone hates him can you overthrow him and execute him i guess that's that's up to them but i, I don't know the rules exactly of you know who was the first could one? a king could a king commit treason against his own kingdom well if treason is harm against the crown or like a, an english person harming the crown then it's it's hairy you know it's a strange it's well how can the person wearing the crown harm the crown so it all comes down to you know what do you identify as as treason so if treason is against a country sure king commit treason against his own king their king was he still a king these questions will be answered with the trial of king charles the first i'm so ready i'm so ready you guys ready we're doing it on jane but in two separate videos all right see you guys